today, God is immutable. He never changes. And why is that important to us? The immutability of God, his quality of not changing, is clearly taught throughout Scripture. For example, in Malachi 3.6, God affirms, I, the Lord, do not change. James 17, uh, James 1, verse 17, also teaches the immutability of God. For every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Usually everyone knows exactly what that means, except they stumble over the point of shadow of turning. What is that? Shadow of turning refers to our perspective on the sun. It is eclipsed. It moves. It casts shadows. The sun rises and sets, appears and disappears every day. It comes out of one tropic and enters into another at certain seasons of the year. But with God, who spiritually speaking is light itself, there is no darkness at all, there is no change with him, nor anything like it. Now, at this particular time, speaking to people that were not aware of how it actually worked, which took many years before science understood, they did think that everything rotated around us, the moon, the stars, the sun. So it was telling them, even though we move around the sun and the sun sits still, it truly doesn't because that even moves through the universe. God is unchangeable in his future, in nature, in perfections, purposes, promises, and gifts. He being holy cannot turn that which is evil, nor can he who is the fountain of light cause of darkness. Since every good and perfect gift comes from him, evil cannot proceed from him, nor can he tempt any to it. James 1, 13 through 15 says, Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desire. Then when the illicit desire comes and is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. The Bible is clear that God does not change his mind, his will, or his nature. First of all, he doesn't need to. He's God. But he doesn't leave it at that. He goes deeper to explain why it actually is that way. There are several logical reasons why God is immutable. That is why it's impossible for him to change. First, if anything changes, it must do so in some chronological order. It must be a point in time before the change and a point in time after the change. When something is set, either we went backwards and looked at what was what and made the change, or we go forward and look back at a change. God is not in time. He's outside of time. There is no sensible reason for him to make a change. We can do something that makes a change. We could be cooking, and remember that the fire should be medium. And we put it on low, because we needed to do something else, and we came back and go, oh, I forgot to bring it up to medium, and go make that change. He's outside of time. He sees everything the way it is. There's no reason to make a change. Everything lies before him all the time. Like I said, I think it was last week. He sees the last day. He knows exactly what's going to happen on the last day here on earth. And the reason I say last day is because that is the end of time. Once this period of time, which had a beginning and will have an end, goes by, we're in his world, or we're in the wrong place, 
And there is no time. The thought, the fear to think that you did not turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and instead will spend eternity, which means never coming to an end, in hell. It's unbelievable. That's a horrific thought. But God is true and just, not just loving. So you will spend eternity there. While you're here, he tells you in his word, that's not the place to be, and you should not go there. I did not create you for that purpose, but he knows many will be lost. Now, when we someday, if we wind up thinking, boy, it's great up here. It's absolutely fabulous, better than I could have ever imagined. And it's never going to end. What would the need of time be? We don't need periods of time. When we talk now, it's very hard to explain anything without relating to time in one way, shape, or another. We talk about next week. We talk about Christmas coming. We talk about an hour ago. We talk about time constantly. We live every movement of our life in time. But there we won't. So that alone is going to make that place absolutely different. As a matter of fact, it's going to make both places absolutely different. Anything changes, it must do so in chronological order. There must be a point of time for the change and point of time after the change. So for change to take place, it must happen within the constraints of time. However, God is eternal and exits outside the constraints of time. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, For he delivered us and saved us and called us with a holy calling, a calling that leads to a consecrated life, a life set apart, a life of purpose, not because of our works or because of any personal merit. We could do anything to earn this, but because his own purpose and grace, his amazing, undeserved favor, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. <clears throat> if you find yourself living each day and questioning, uh, I hope I don't live really too long. I really don't want to die, but I don't want to live too long because this is getting boring. I mean, I'm doing the same thing over and over. <clears throat> There's nothing to look forward to. Uh, you missed your calling. God doesn't have retirement in this plan for us. The day he puts you into retirement is the day you take your last breath. He wants you to be active and to be doing the job he put you here for. Each one of us are in different positions, even all of us that are retired. We're in different positions than each other. But there's a purpose that we still have to do. Carry his word to those that have not heard it, or those that don't understand it, or loved ones that we have that we've seen to have told them a few times, but they still don't get the point. That's our job. You don't want to stand there at the last day at judgment and say to God, well, I tried, but you know, after once or twice I gave up on the deal, you know? No, don't beat them to death with the Bible, but at the same time, don't quit on them. There's always prayer. Second, the immutability of God is necessary for his perfection. If anything changes, it must change for the better or for the worse. A change that makes no difference is not a change. Well, he doesn't have to change for the better. He's given us the best. Everything he does is the best. And it doesn't change for the worse, obviously. That's common sense. So what's the need for a change? His immutability covers the fact that he does not need to change. For change to take place, either something that is needed is added, which is a change for the better, or something that is needed is lost, which is a change for the worse. But since God is perfect, he does not need anything. Therefore, he cannot change for the better. If God were so to lose something, he would no longer be perfect. Therefore, he cannot change for the worse. 
This God is different than we are. We live in a world that's full of flaws and mistakes. That's not God. Our God is exceptional, beyond comprehension. He is immutable. Everything he does is perfectly correct. Sir, the immutability of God is related to his omniscience. Omniscience is the property of having complete or maximal knowledge. He knows everything. There is nothing that he does not know. Whether it's in time or outside of time, he has complete knowledge. We have such a limited knowledge, and some of us are highly limited. Some of us, when we look at it, we say, I don't know how they breathe. They, you know, they, they, they'd stop breathing. They, they'd forget to breathe if it wasn't for someone who married the right person. Get up, get up, wait, breathe, breathe. You know, that's how we are. We're that, but God is not. Numbers 23.19 clearly presents the immutability of God. God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? No, God does not change his mind. He is unchanging and unchangeable. You have to remember that everything you read in God's word, that's a punishment of sorts. It's been figured out based on his justice and his love and his concern, and if he says this is what will happen, it will happen. If you sit down and read Revelation, that's what's before us. It is going to happen. There's no reason for God to make a statement. Why well, kid around when, I think I've told you this too, I'm getting old. It used to be when Brandy would do something, our daughter, Louise would go, no, no, you, you shouldn't do that. No, no, you can't do that. Brandy, I said, no, no, no. And I would say to her, why do you keep repeating yourself? Didn't you tell her once, is that not enough? If you need to keep repeating yourself, it's you that's doing the wrong. She needs to see you back up the statement you make when you say no. And that's how I was. If I said it once, that was enough. She related to me on that basis. She related, this is why my family said, you rule with an iron fist. I think they thought I was Joseph Stalin. <laughs> I just didn't see a need to keep repeating. And Louise, out of the love and kindness of her heart, always did it that way. I think that's why God put us together. She was the brakes for me who was racing forward all the time. If she went too slow, my racing forward dragged her along. Perfect unity. God knows these things. We don't. But it is true. God doesn't repeat himself. He spoke his word. It was all that was needed. He will back up what he says. His immutability gives us that. If we want to tempt God and test him to see, we're going to come out on the short end of the stick. Immutable, again, he never changes, Malachi 3, 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Who are the descendants of Jacob? The Jews. Why are they still here, battling to stay alive? Because God said they will. These are his chosen people, chosen for a lot of horrific things. Don't get me wrong. They weren't chosen for wonderful things. Probably the worst of all was putting Christ to death, calling for his crucifixion. But it doesn't matter. He doesn't change, and he proves that. The fact that he loved the Jews, who would be the children of Abraham, he promised to Abraham that they would always be here. And they are. We've seen great powerful nations try to take them out. As you see now, they're still here. And they will be here till the last day because that's what God says. And at the same time, that should have been a 
thought of fear for them. They've made a lot of mistakes. That's the reason they've been punished. Because God said, don't do this or don't do that. And he didn't have to repeat himself. His immutability said, this is one of my characteristics. Fear it as you fear me as you should. Then you will love me. Malachi began with a reminder that God's judgment can result in the destruction of an entire nation. Malachi 1 verses 1 through 4. Eden <coughs> sinned and eventually always obliterated. Israel, on the other hand, has been preserved by God. At one time, Israel honored God the way he intended them to. In Malachi's day, the people had moved away from God to improper sacrifices, divorce, the people then moved from, away from God in, in paganism. What is the, the verse points out this clearly in that Israel's survival is not because of their own merit. They don't have the best military in the world. They don't have the best equipment in the world. They have the greatest God in the world. They still have Jehovah God. They still worship Jehovah God. God is God. Now, they did not accept Jesus Christ, and we're seeing more today than ever before coming to know Christ. But the basis for that is salvation. Those that have come to know Christ will be saved. We, the church, that know Jesus Christ will be saved. Many of the people that go to church will not be saved because their intention is to live their own life and spend an hour here every Sunday. And I'm not meaning this particular church. I'm, I'm, I'm meaning all the Christian churches throughout the country. It's not a tradition or a ritual to go to church. It's a place to come and worship God. Those that do, from the heart, desire to please Him, desire to love Him, and be grateful for what He's done for them, they are worshiping God the way He wants to see it. He doesn't care if the voices don't sound like good when they sing. <laughs> to him, it's a beautiful noise. Numbers 18.32. The one and only reason they have not been annihilated is because God does not change, and so his promises are secure. God does not change. Who he is, ne who he is never changes. His attributes are the same from before the beginning of time into eternity. All these attributes of God were his before he created anything. And they will be his after all of this is done away with. And there's a new heaven and a new earth, a new universe. But he'll still be the same God. His character never changes. He never gets better or worse. His plans do not change. His promises do not change. This ought to be a source of incredible joy for a believer. Sam Storms writes this about the good news of God's unchanging nature. What all this means, very simply, is that God is dependable. Our trust in Him is therefore a confident trust, for we know that He will not, indeed, change. When I think of things that I've done wrong since I've been saved, since I know Jesus Christ the way I do, I think to myself, this is terrible. When am I ever going to stop? Well, because of my sin nature, I can only get better, but I'll probably never stop. There's things that I do or think or say that are not good. But God knew that when he saved me. And he didn't save me on the basis of how good I will be in the future. He saved me because he chose to do so. I didn't choose to find this God as my Lord and Savior. After he chose me, I come to know that as a fact. And all these promises are there for me. I accept the fact that he will do what he says he will do, and we will see, if we're here, what takes place in the end times, the last seven years of wrath. We will see what happens to those on this planet that did not accept him and thought that they were greater. We often say to ourselves, if God knew 
everything. Why is it that he allowed it to happen? Why did he allow Satan, if he created Satan, to do what he did? Think about that. It's a simple answer. Satan was a tool. He has many great, magnificent angels, and he could make one greater than Satan was. That wasn't what was necessary. He needed a tool, and he created a tool. A tool that would be used until the last day. That's why when the false prophet and the beast are thrown into the pit of fire, Satan spends a thousand years living with us. He's in prison for that thousand year period, but then he's set free for a short while. Why? Because he has to work again. It's time for him to do what he does. And nobody does sin like he, he does. I mean, this is all Satan lives for. That's why God tells us to be aware. Watch how we live our lives. He's waiting. You won't be tempted by him unless you have a weakness that he can exploit. And that's what does happen. Like I said before, the person that goes on a diet, the first thing they think about is all the great foods they've ever eaten. I mean, wow, could I go for a jelly donut? I rode around the block quite a few times before I stopped and found the parking space in front of the bakery. I went out of my way to sin. We do. We fall short of that church. Then after it's over, we know we've done wrong and the Holy Spirit puts his thumb on us in guilt. Then we realize, you yeah, know, he still forgave me for these things. When am I going to change? We all need to change. We all need to become more like him. That's why he sent us the perfect example, his son, Jesus Christ. Someone we could live like as best as possible with his help. His purposes are unfailing, his promises irrefutable. It is because the God who promised us eternal life is immutable that we may rest assured that, as it says in Romans 8, 31 through 39. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God did not hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything he wouldn't gladly do and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us? who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love? There is now no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not buying threats, not backstabbing not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Keep in mind, we can't lose our salvation for more than our sake. If the Father gives us to the Son, which is what Scripture teaches us, then he would be, hate to use the term, but I will, being an Indian giver to Jesus Christ. Well, son, you did a good job but I have to take him back again. We're sending him to hell. He keeps sinning and hasn't stopped. How could he say that to his son who did everything for us? He can't. He doesn't change, he's immutable. When scripture tells us that our salvation is permanent for good, that's part of that immutable. They kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're sitting ducks. They pick us off one by one. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, not living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, 
high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Let's close in prayer. Holy Father, it is a true blessing to us that you are immutable, that you don't change. You've protected us, you've blessed us, you've put us in the right position, and even though we're frail and we make mistakes, we cannot bring condemnation upon ourselves because you are immutable. And once you've done what you've done for us, it's permanent. And we praise you for that. In your son's holy and precious name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.